Hi everyone, thanks for coming down today. Um, so today we'll be doing a workshop on automation in Python. Um, so if you haven't already, you can um, go find the slides at this URL and also um, the if you want to run the code and follow through, you can um, go to this the second URL as well. Yeah, so uh, this is our um, kind of like a series of workshops. Like first one was uh, last week, I think, uh, Intro to Python. And then this today will be Automation in Python. And in two weeks, uh, we'll have, be having data wrangling and visualization in Python. And lastly, uh, Intro to ML with Scikit-learn. So I think uh, the next two are held by uh, Data Science Society. Um, if I'm wrong. Uh, so, Hacker School is our this uh, this this uh, this our hacker school kind of plan for this semester. Um, next week we'll be having Telegram bots, uh, the Telegram bots, and uh, so the next two after Telegram bots will be the Data Science Society, and I think after recess week we'll be having uh some web development workshops with JavaScript, HTML, React, and stuff. So this uh about us uh, Chris and I will be the um the speakers today uh so we are both year four computer science students and yeah uh, so i'll be doing the first half of the workshop and please will be doing the second half of the workshop um so this is our workshop objectives we just uh want to introduce some um common python tools and maybe some uh, more slightly more advanced python concepts because um to use those tools, you might need a bit of like OOP or like some other concepts. And yeah, we're trying to be doing more, slightly more useful things with Python, um, or like just to build on the first workshop. So, um, it's like, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, Python won't help you to mop your floor or feed your dog after today. And yeah, we're not really a coding bootcamp. We are not. We won't, we won't be comprehensive. If you want to be a comprehensive resource, uh, the documentation is probably the best place for this. So we just want to show you enough to be self-sufficient. Uh, this is our outline for today. Uh, first, we're covering how to install the party packages. And after that, we'll go through some simple OOP and reading and writing files. And follow finally, uh, some image manipulation and web scraping. Yeah, so... I'll be talking about Python package manager next. Oh, let me just see if I can minimize this. Yeah, so the default Python actually comes with uh, a lot of batches included. Like the standard library has a lot of things, but um, yeah, so the standard library does have things for handling date time, math functions, like accessing internet. But if you want to do like, um, if you want to do like automations and stuff, you probably will have to reach out for some third-party packages. So these third-party packages will have to be installed before they can be used. Oh yeah, so you can, there's actually a couple of ways you can go about installing it. So pip is like the default way. Uh, and usually we'll, if you install Python through like the internet, you'll probably have pip installed. So um, there's pros and cons of using pip over conda. I won't really go dive into the pros and cons, but um, I think one of the main differences to note is that conda doesn't just install like Python packages. It can also install like some like other C and C++ like build packages for your system as well. So, um, which is useful because sometimes uh, the certain Python packages, they might require like other like 
C or C++ packages to be built as well. So um, if you're like just starting out, I, I would, and then you don't have like any um like previous um way of handling Python, I would just recommend using Conda because like Conda also comes out with like also ships with a default uh way to handle environments like Python environments. So if you're going to use pip, you still have to like find another way to handle environments like virtual env and stuff. So it's a bit more complicated to use pip. Um, so if you install Conda, you probably need about two to three gigabytes for all the packages that you will come with. So if you don't want to have all these pre-installed packages, you can also try mini Conda. So mini Conda is basically Conda with the building command and so like the environments handling and just without all the pre-installed packages. Yeah, but if I'm assuming on a modern laptop, you probably have two to three gigabytes, so you can just go ahead and install uh, the normal version of Anaconda. So uh, you can just Google this and like you probably just like Anaconda install. And so based on yours, I, I'm hoping that for this workshop, you actually already have installed this because if you haven't, um, installing this can take some time, especially if you're not familiar with installing these kind of things. So um, yeah, if, Nowadays, you can like choose between M1 or non-M1 MacBook, I think, for Windows Mac. So if you're on Windows Mac, there's a GUI installer option. But otherwise, uh, for Mac and Linux, there's also a command line option. Um, so basically, the command line option, you download the file. You can um, try to verify the hash, but or, or you can just like just execute it um, just with the bash something something dot sh. And then if and then you just like press enter a couple of times and then you should have it installed in a couple of minutes. Okay, so actually that's so I'm assuming that yeah, okay. So uh there's also Conda for uh yeah, Conda Forge is probably a better um better repository for all the Conda packages, in my opinion, because like it tends to be more updated. Um but yeah, I don't, I don't really want to go in, into how to um all the de little details here. So if you if you want to use Conda Forge, I think you can just um Google how to change the main um repository to Conda Forge. Um yeah, okay, so next I'll be going to some OOP. Um so I'm gonna assume that um like based on the because the prerequisites is the, the first workshop, so I'm gonna assume this is the first time you might have heard of this. Um, so yeah, so I'll be defining some terms. So variables and so you might have heard of variables and functions. So in a, in the context of an object, variables and functions, there's another jargon name for it, which is uh, attributes and methods. So attributes are basically variables, but in the context of a class. And same thing with methods. So <laughs> In Python, uh, everything is an object, including basic data types like integers and strings and stuff. So, if you go in, into like a Python console, you like say you type in like i equals forty five, you can actually no notice that this i dot and you when you press like tag, there's a couple of like methods that you can use, like such a numerator, and then you can like say for example this string, there's like a string dot upper this this method here as well. So, this is one of the cool things about Python, I guess. Um, so, oh, yeah, so without brackets, it's not really a method, it's more like an um, attribute. So, attribute is like a variable that is assigned to this instance of the object. Yeah, so actually, this numerator here is just like a variable for that object, whereas the brackets here is like a, a, a call to the function. Mm, yeah, so. Usually in a lot of other languages like C++, uh, usually like there will be basic data types that are like basically not <laughs> objects and you cannot have all these funny things happening to them. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite a interesting concept. Um, yeah, so a class is kind of like a blueprint for creating an object. So it's like um, a basically a, like, a, like a bunch of like let's let's say you want to have this entity like this concept of an object and then you want to have like functions or data like associated with the object like bundled together so the, the way one the way of doing that is to create a class so just think of it as bundling functions and variables together and 
So an object is basically an instance of a class. So like one instance. So um, actually in, in the rest of the code, we won't be actually creating our classes. But so because usually it's, it's sufficient to import the ones that we need for third party libraries, but it's good to like know what they are underneath. So just to like be more clear on what you're typing out. <clears throat> so um, just go through one example. So the class, you, you create a class by, oh sorry, you, you create a, you create a class like in the concept of the blueprint, not like instantiate uh, instance of a class by this uh, using this keyword class here. And then, uh, so Python has this um, magic method syntax, which is basically uh, double underscores on. So double underscores basically means that uh, this function is not really like, it's not really my kind of, it's not really, I won't really call this function, but Python will call this function on under specific circumstances. So. For this init uh, magic function, basically, uh, Python will call this function when you're initiating a class. And so you notice also like the, the class has, um, so you, you, see, you see you can provide uh, variables, you can provide parameters on how to initiate the class, like name and age. And there's also this self um, keyword here, and you can notice that um, this self keyword appears for all the other functions as well. So this is actually one of the quotes of Python, like which doesn't have happen in other OOP languages. Yeah, so um what, what happens is that for each method under a class, you have to provide an extra argument in every function. And the extra argument is always in the first position, and the first position and the argument basically refers to the current instance of the class that you're calling from. So it, it, it sounds like a bit of jargon, but I, 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 try, I try to explain as more goes on. Um, but basically, um, yeah, I'll explain more from the next slide because I really need the example of initiating a class. Yeah, so for now, just remember that each, um, each method that you create under a class, you need to add an extra argument called self. And then, so this self refers to the instance of a class itself, so you can like, uh, reference the variables like self.name and self.h. So um, you assign you assign the basically you assign variables to class to the class by using uh, in the init function you assign like self.name and self.h and then in the rest of the afterwards in outside the class and so within the class you can assess these two variables. Yeah so for example uh, in the, in the next uh, description method, you can see that uh, when I have this reference to the instance object itself, I have like uh, access to self.name and self.h. And then the next one is just basically I mix in uh, another parameter passing to that function, which is sound, and then I can also like have self.name here. Yeah, so okay, actually I want to have this. So the previous class was here. And how you create it is basically, uh, you, so uh, even though when you create methods in a class, you have to add this extra self parameter, um, when you actually call them, you do not include that parameter. Yeah, this is just one of the quotes of Python. Um, it's a bit confusing why they want to do it this way, but it, it has to be done. And uh, so, yeah, so when you create, this is when you create an instance of this class, you ignore the first, this first parameter, and then you just continue with them from, from there. Like, so the name is Charlie, and then H is two. And then, so for description, you can see that you ignore the first parameter, and then there's no, you don't have to specify any arguments. Um, yeah, so this, you, you can just try to, so, so if, if the dog has the name Charlie and H2, then when you call description, it will have uh, Charlie, it will print out this string. So you return the string. So I think this of uh, if you've never seen this F thing before, it's basically I think it's a Python three point seven or six uh, syntax for like basically I substitute whatever is in this angle brackets with uh, the variable here. So I will just basically substitute the string, like substitute the string representation of whatever variable is in this angle brackets. <laughs> yeah. So. 
actually, uh, just so it just as the uh, in the side, like actually you don't have to name this self. It can be called like A B C or like yeah whatever you want. So like if for example if this was A B C, you can like A B C dot name equals to name and A B C dot H equals to H. It's just like it's not a like the standard practice is to just name it as self. Yeah. So basically, whatever first uh, argument that's provided to every function in the class, it will just refer to the instance of the object. Okay, so next I will go through uh, reading and writing files. Um, so actually for most of the programs you write, um, you kind of have to read input from somewhere, someplace, or maybe it'll be like a, a trigger from some event. And if you have to process it, transform it in some way, and then you have to write out the input in some way, maybe like you print it to the terminal or you write it, save the data somewhere. Yeah, so actually, if you write a, a lot of programs, you will come into reading and writing files a lot. Um, yeah, so one of the things that you have to deal with is the file paths. So if you're writing your own program, you don't have to worry about the different file paths or whatnot. Um, but basically, Windows uses like this type of black slashes, and then I think uh, the other uh, Unix operating systems use forward slash. So if you have, like, like if you just write out a, a path string like in a certain way, then it might not work for a different type of operating system. So, like if, if yeah, and also like Windows also starts with this C, whereas like Mac Linux starts with the forward slash. So. Like if, if you just want like like a convenient way to like not have to think about all this at all, then there's a very convenient library, I think in the standard library, uh, which is called Pathlib. So yeah, so the way to use Pathlib is that um you 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 just await a statement and then um I mean this import statement will probably work for 99 percent of the use cases. And let me just sorry, a quick glance at the chat. Um yeah, and then you can basically specify any number of arguments to initiate a, the class for path. So for example, in this case, you can see like I have spam bacon eggs and then it will just like join all these strings together and then um, with, with a slash. So this slash is like kind of like a OS uh, agnostic independent kind of slash. So if, if it's Windows, it will be the, the other slash. If it's Mac or Linux, it will be the forward slash. <laughs> Yeah, so as you can see from the doc example, this is basically the same kind of class thing that you create this path object and then based on specifying this arguments to the init function and then it will just return you an instance of the object, which is for, for, for Unix, I think it will give you a POSIX path. The otherwise, I think it's a unique Windows path or something. <laughs> okay, so um, there's also, so, uh, actually, one of the common ways to use Puppet is that um, you want to get the current working directory, and then from that current working directory, you specify uh, like the path like, relative to that current working directory. So current working directory basically means the 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 current folder they are in. So usually, in the context of Python, this is probably like where your Python file is located. Yeah. So. Like it's just it's just uh, one of the ways to work with. You can also start from the root directory, which is slash or like for for Mac Linux, and then for for Windows will be C uh colon something. So yeah, that's that's just one of the ways. Uh, so you can specify path dot current working directory, and then you can see you have this slash operator. So this slash operator when when one of the first two um when one of the first two operands to this slash operator is a path object. Then this slash operator won't be like considered a divide operator. It will be more like a, a concatenate the the paths together to form a path object. Yeah, but be, so because of the other evaluations, uh, one of the first two values must be the path object for this slash operator to work. Otherwise, you will get some. Um, so if you, for example, you try to like join strings together using this slash operator, then you get some unsupported operand type string and string. Yeah. Oh yeah, also I think one of the common like gotchas when using pathlib is that uh because it returns you a path, like this path object instead of a string. Um like sometimes if you use like some um let's say uh like a function that expects the path in terms of a string, then it would you, you, you just have to remember to convert it to a string. Yeah, so you can convert it to a string just like I think str bracket 
and then like throw in the path object and it will automatically convert to a string. But actually now, nowadays, most of the standard libraries in Python, um, they they will ex they will accept a path path object. Like they, so you don't have to do it like for most of the standard library in, in Python. <coughs> yeah. So um glob is just a, like another um so path object has like a couple of functions and um what's the word they are looking for? Couple, couple of functions and attributes uh read, read that comes with that allows makes makes your life a bit easier when you're trying to manipulate paths and stuff stuff to do with paths. So one of the functions that it has is this glob thing. So glob basically takes all the basically gives you back all the paths or of all the files and folders in that folder. Yeah, so let's say your, your path is this um, desktop, and then when you glob, it will give you a generator object. Okay, let me, let me just explain what's the generator object later, slightly later. So if you turn the generator object into a list, and, and then you can see that, um, yeah, I have this list of paths that are all the, basically all the items in this folder. Okay, uh, let me see, how should I go? Uh, I, I'll go through a generator object again, maybe probably in the code, I think. Yeah, so it's, it's more clever. So basically a generator is kind of like, I will lazily return values instead of like giving out all the values, it like immediately like storing all of these values in the memory, I will just return the next value. So that it's, it's just like a memory saving technique. Okay. Um. Yeah, so in, instead of like globbing everything, like this style operator, um, you can, let's say you want a specific type of file, like you want PDFs or you want images, you can just like uh, star dot something and then you will match everything that's, that does, ends with this suffix dot text. So yeah, pretty straightforward. Um, other things, uh, yeah, so let's say uh, there's also like some other, um, methods that comes with this path object, which allows you to like say check if the path exists or if it exists and it's the file or it's a directory, it's just like to, to make your, your life a bit easier. So like, let's say you want to check whether the, the path like is, you want to, before, before, you open a path, before you open a file, you can check whether it is the file and it exists just so that you don't get any errors. Oh, okay, still have. Uh, yeah, so not just now we talk about uh, paths and stuff. So um, now we're talking about, now, now we'll go through uh, how to like write to files. So as, as I talked about just now, like a lot of programs to write, you probably be taking in some kind of input data from somewhere. Maybe it's like a web script data or maybe it's like um, some, some user input data. Uh, and then you're trying to process, do some processing to this data and then you probably have tried to print it out to somewhere or save the data to somewhere. So in the case of saving, you, then you want to write to files, right? So the way to do it in Python is the, there's a built-in function for this. Um, do you have to import anything? So how it works is, is that uh, there's a, this uh, function called open and then you specify the file path and also the, the mode of, the mode that you want to open it with in. So um this mode can be like read or write or like yeah so i think read back a pen if i'm not wrong yeah so and then so open will give you back um kind of like a handle to the file and then you can like call it will give you back an object as well uh and then you can write things to the object and then afterwards you're done with writing you can call close on the file so it's it's always good programming practice to, I mean, after you open a file to close it before you do other things just so that you know you don't like you won't have like uh yeah it, it's, it's just good practice to close files after you are done reading or write, reading or writing them um but in python there's another better syntax for this um uh, you can use this with open sf and after after this with clause exits it automatically close the file for you so you don't know, like, oh, I have to write f.close. <laughs> yep. So just now we, so the, the in the W mode, uh, it's, it's, it's like just writing. And then there's also read mode, which is, uh, you, you can just read the entire file as a single string. And I think there's also like, if you want it in terms of lines, there's also read lines and other things as well. <laughs> okay, so. 
Let's go through the notebook. Oh, actually, I think I already opened. Yeah, so um, I'll be going through the notebook in Colab, Google, Google Colab. So um, Google Colab is basically this um, they offer like free runtimes to, I think I think they sometimes it, it, it comes to GPU as well if you want to request for a GPU. So it's quite useful if you want to like run Python stuff and then you don't want to install Python or anything. Yeah, so I think it comes with, I think the, currently the version of Python is still 3.7, if I'm not wrong. So in, in Google Colab, uh, I think I think actually no, not just in Google Colab, I think in Jupyter Notebook in general, um, you can run this, uh, and then you can run a shell command, you can just uh, prefix it with like this exclamation mark and then it, will, it won't be a Python thing anymore, it will, it will be running in a, in a command line. So let's say I want to just, Download this folder. Uh, say down, download the code folder. I can get clone, and then when you open the files tab, it will be here. So this this was just like git clone just now. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I think the first thing that I want to run through is like basically how to, uh, let, let, let's say let's say like you have a couple of like text files, and then you want to, um, say add today's date to it. Yeah. So. I think that's a simple example to start with. Um, so you do the import for date time. Date time is in the standard library. You don't have to, uh, all, all, all this path lead and date time are in the standard library. Um, and so now let's say I want to get, so in the, in the GitHub repo, I think there's I have some, I have some sample data in there. So um, you can see there's some text files here. So let's say I want to, uh, so first, I want to get a handle on this, uh, this folder, this text folder. So, um, if actually, actually, yeah. So for if you're not sure what's the current path in Colab, I think you can just run uh this, and then it should tell you. So yeah, it's in slash content. So I think if you press this button, then it will or, or something. Then you can see that actually. Oh sorry. Yeah, so this this entire folder is the current working directory. So you can just like um this current working directory slash automation with Python slash data and then you can slash text. So that, that's, how, that's how you get into the folder. Yeah, so after you run this, you can see that um uh, I have this path object. So now I want to get all the text files in this object. So uh, we, we went through glob just now. You can glob by the the path uh ex, the file extension, and then it will give you all the file paths for that. Yeah, but as as we said just now, this is actually a, like a generator object. So um, if you try to inspect it, yeah. So in Jupyter Notebook, you can if you the, the last um how to say the last value um on its own will always be printed out to the to the to the cell. So. Yes, you can inspect it just by typing out this instead of like having to print. Yeah. So you can see this is a generator object. So actually, this generator object, uh, one of the ways to get values from this is to call the next. So next is like a like another Python keyword. Um, oh sorry, for pass. And then it will give you the next item. So the next item is node one, and then we run it again. You get node two, and then. You just keep running it. And but eventually you see there'll be no more. So um after that, so after it runs out all its values, the generator will be so-called like exhausted. And then you can't you can't like get values from it anymore until you reset it. And the only unfortunately the only way to reset it in Python is to just rerun the expression that created a generator in the first place. So I, I rerun it and then um so let's say I want to look at the list. And then I have this list. Yeah, so actually, actually this list operator also exhausts the whole generator. So if you want to rerun this thing again, that you get an empty list. So this is just one of the um, possible bugs that you might encounter if you are coding in Python. So just remember to, if you, you want to assign it, and then if you want to like so-called exhaust it, you have, you have to make sure that it has the, 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 the values are saved somewhere, like in a variable. So I'm not gonna run this for now. Um, Yeah, so let me just delete. Sorry, let me just comment out this cell for now, just so that I can. Uh, yeah, so 
now that we have the handle on the file path, which is like all the nodes here, uh, I will get today's date. So um, actually for, for how, to, how to, you don't have to remember all these like syntax details. So if you probably next time you want to find out how to like get today date, today's date in Python, you just Google Stack Overflow or something, and then they'll probably give you one of these lines. And, you, and then so basically what, what this happens, what, what this means is that I think it's string format time, and then you try to format it by day, month, and year. So um so yeah, for this for this case is 27 August. And so let, let, I want to. So now I want to insert the date in for the first line in the first line for all the text files. Um. So I think one good practice to have is that when you when you're if you're modifying files, you try not to overwrite them because let's say if something goes wrong, that like you might be overwriting your current data, and then you might encounter data loss in case like let's say you just write to a file without any new lines, then it might just it will just overwrite the entire file. So one of the good practices to have is to create another separate directory and create a copy of that folder and then just like copy all the files over. So in case there's any bugs in your programming or something, you don't overwrite the file. So in this case, I will create another output directory. Um, so I will call, so I have data, I have a folder data here, right? So I want maybe like, I don't want to call it output and then slash text. So I will save it in this part. And so I don't have, the folder output and I also don't have the folder text now. So when you don't have both, like let's, let's say when you, there's like along this chain of folders, like I have more than one folder that I don't have. So you can call make directory with parents equals to true. Then it will just make all the folders that's required in the path. And then now if you run this and then I think if you refresh, yeah, so now there's output and then in the output I also have text. So I created two folders here. And yeah, so we talked about the generator object just now. So actually in a generator object, it's not, it's not needed to turn this into a list or something. You can actually just run a for loop on the generator itself and then it will work perfectly fine. You don't, in fact, you don't even have to know that it's a generator object. I said that probably if, if you rerun this code twice, it will not work for the second time. Yeah, so uh, now for each, each of the file paths in that generator object, I want to open it, read it, and I want to, open the, sorry, uh, I want to open it, read it, and I want to create a new file in the output directory that has the same name as the original file name. So open it with write, and then I will just write today's date, slash new line, and then plus the original text. Yeah, so just go through this again. I read the, so I read all the text in the, in the file, and then I, I create a new file, using this. So, so this open will actually create a new file. If the if there's no existing current file, they will, it will create a new file for me. And then I write I write all the content of the old contents and then plus today's date and new line. And I think sometimes you have to refresh for the word collect. Yeah, so uh, you can see that previously, I think the data was some, I think it's some Laurel, it's some, Okay, so previously it was like this, and now you have this date here with a new line. So this is just one example of like taking some input, processing it, and then like saving it to to our like output directory. Yeah. So I guess so. Just just to like maybe like um another example of like reading and writing files is. Probably if you want to like automatically sort your downloads folder. So if you're like me, I think my your downloads folder probably be like super messy and like I mean it's like just a lot of stuff. And yeah, so if like, if you want to like make it organized, um like this one of the, I think one of the things you can do is to maybe like can create a script to like move all the folders according to their um file names, um so the file extensions and then you can create separate folders for each of the file extensions. So for example, you want like all your images into images and all your audio into yeah I, th I think I think I think you get the point but yeah basically um I mean I mean currently I think if you're using like Mac or Windows the GUI like some of the GUIs they, they kind of have like ways to organize it based on the file extensions as well but if you just want like more explicit I guess so actually I, I think I 
in, in the code example that is, uh, that is in the GitHub, I think there's no, the last three is omitted. So if you're following along, just add the last three in. So the reason I added the last three uh, is because I don't have a download folder in Colab. So what I did was the sample data here, which, so this sample data comes up with every instance of Colab. So what I want to do now is I want to sort this sample data folder instead of, like let's say a download folder. <laughs> oh yeah. And so before I run the code, I just like run through it. My, uh, tell you what, talk, talk, talk about it. So I got everything in the downloads folder and for each of the file paths, so yeah, this one is a generator. And for each of the file paths, I get the file extension using this uh, suffix. So this file path, you guys remember, is a path object. So this path object has a lot of like useful um, attributes uh, or like functions to like help you do things like, so for example, if I, would, if I want the file extension, I can just call doc suffix and I'll get a file extension. And so if the next, I want to check if the file extension is in any of these uh, keys. So actually, um, I'm not sure we've done this. I'm not sure if they went through dictionary in the first workshop. So this uh, angle brackets uh, and then with this key to value mapping is, is called uh, a dictionary in Python. So um, the way to check if a key exists in a dictionary in Python is to just use if this key is in dictionary. So this will check if it's a key. Yeah, so it won't check if it's a value, it will just check if it's a key. So, um, so if the file extension is in this dictionary, I will uh, get a des I'll get a destination to save it prop to, which is I'll get the original folder, for the, the path to the folder, and then I will um concatenate that with this uh this new like another subdirectory name. So the subdirectory name, it will be uh, to get a value from this dictionary. So the value, you get a value from the dictionary just using this uh, square brackets and the key, and it will give you the value. So for example, if your key is PDF, then the values will be PDFs. And then if, the, if the, this subdirectory folder doesn't currently exist, I will just make directory. I'll just create, so I'll just create the, the folder. And then I will rename so rename is kind of like uh I move like re rename in the sense of like Linux and all that is like kind of like moving files. So I, I move the file from the original location to this new location, which is uh the this destination folder and then like the original name of the file. So if you run this, yeah, and then you refresh collect, and you see like uh all the I have all the data sorted here in. Oh, sorry. Was that okay? <laughs> okay, no way. Uh, yeah, so just one of the things. Uh, yeah. Okay, so next I'll go through like another like um more it's a slightly more complicated example. Like let's say let's say you're writing like your university student, you have like the essay writing mods, and then you want to uh, after you finish writing essay, you want to improve it by uh, finding your overused words and then trying to get synonyms for that overused words. Um so if you use like something like Grammarly or something, I think it will die, it will do for you also. But for the rest of us that want to go through something more, um, want to want to hack, hack something out, then you can try one of these things. So this, I won't say this is the perfect implementation, um, but yeah, this I think this is the one that does the minimal setup. Um, so <clears throat> first you need this uh, library called NLTK. So I think NLTK is pre-installed for Colab, but if you're using your own, um. I think if you use Miniconda or like if you just use Python, then it might not come with NLTK. But Anaconda, I think, should have NLTK. So if you don't have it, just pick install or conda install NLTK and then you should be good to go. Let me just pause one second at this chat. Okay, so uh, the, for the first time you use NLTK, you have to um, download certain data sets for NLTK for the parts that you want to use because uh, NLTK does is it's like the whole by by its whole is quite a big like if you try to download everything it can be considered big um so it doesn't come with the original installation you have to like download it separately if so basically if you don't run download I think you will come out with some error and then the error will tell you to run this command sorry to to, to run this additional line and then you will be able to fix it just by reading an error um yeah so I just import NLTK and then 
So there are certain things that I want from NLTK, which are the stop words and tokenize. So uh, let me explain what stop words is. So stop words are basically, um, I can't remember the exact definition now of this, but it's, it's like an NLP term for basically term, things like uh, common words that I don't really care about, like say uh, prepositions or like um, just like is, in, these kind of things. Yeah, they are don't really, they're not, not really important words in a sentence. And tokenize, what tokenize does is it basically turns um it turns a, like a string of sentence into like a, a, an a array of words within a, sec, a sentence. Yeah, I, I, I think I think it's clever if I go just go through the code instead of like explain it verbally. Um yeah, and then um so I also want to counter so. Yeah, let me just explain it later when I meet me the code. <laughs> yeah. Um so uh, I also want to uh so I want to open my essay, right? So um let's say my essay is written in Microsoft Word. So um you can okay, actually actually I had, actually, I don't think I've tried it recently. Uh but if you open Microsoft Word using a like a normal Python open syntax, I don't think uh you might not get um perfectly readable text, I think. Yeah, I can't remember what happens when you do it. Um, uh, but I think that so there's a Python library for opening it and reading it like like normally. So you can just try to install this if you don't have it. And then once you install it, you can import docx. Okay. Yeah. So um just, just, a, just a small pointer. Uh if you have, for those of you using Conda, actually uh it's not a good idea to mix pip and conda like usually like it's, it's, it's always like better practice to stick with one package manager like, otherwise you will get weird problems yeah so if you're using conda just run conda install like so the, i think the best practice for conda is like you run conda install and then you if, if, the, if the package is not found within the conda repository then you run pip install and then I think you have to pick install with some other additional flex to like just make sure it doesn't mess up your dependencies. Um, yeah, so getting back to the code. Um, yeah, so I first I defined a, a function called uh so I want to get the text all the all the text as a string from the docx. So I I can create a new function for this um just to like organize the code better. So um as the, as the input to the function, I'll take in the file name. And so I, I will, um, so this docx has this class called document. So every time, every time uh, when you import a third party package and then uh, there's this uh, big capital letters, it, it's probably a class. So that's the naming convention in Python. If it's, it's big capital letters, then it's, so if it starts with a capitalized, then it will be a class. And then if it's like small letters, then it should be a function. So that's the default naming convention. So this basically means that I want to create a document object that uh, has, uh, it, I, I create a, this document object with this uh, initialize with this file name. And I want, now, now I want to read every single paragraph in this document. And I want to um, append each paragraph to this full text. And then so basically this full text will be each of the paragraphs text. And then I will um, join, I, I want to join, so I, I don't want, I don't want an array of strings, right? I want to work with a single string that contains everything. So I will join all the strings in the array with, uh, with a new line. So basically if like I have some text and I have some text B and I will just join them and then it will be separated by new line. So I, I will put this function in memory. And then, um, okay, now the file that I want to work with is I think in sample data. Um, in, oh, sorry, not, not in sample data, uh, in the GitHub data. So previously I have this note, notes directory already, so which is uh, data slash text. And then now I want to have this uh, asteroid dot doc x. So, okay, so um, I think if you open asteroid dot doc x, yeah, sorry, I shouldn't double click it in. Yeah, so if you open this, uh, I think basically uh, I I didn't want to put my actual essay here because I, I think it's quite badly written. So what I've done is I uh, used this tool, online tool to um, generate some essay for me uh, written with 
some deep learning model, GPT-2. And then, um, so all this is autocomplete. I think it just like autocompleted the entire essay for me. And I think it's talking about some asteroid stuff. And yeah, uh, it, 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 it looks grammatically correct at a distance, but I think if you read into it, it's probably like some logical nonsense there. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm using this as well. And then for the doc X, I think I put an image in there just to like, you know, tell, uh, test that it works, even if the image is there to like mess things up. <coughs> yeah, so I get this uh, asteroid, uh, this path to that asteroid dot, dot X, and then I will get text from this. So now if I inspect the text raw, you can see that, yeah, I have this. Oh, actually the new lines are not printing correctly. Yeah, but I think it's okay. Um, yeah, okay, so I have this text now, and now I want to remove the stop words from it. So um, I think, so basically just now we import these stop words, how you can assess the English stop words is basically using this. So if you want to know how I got all this, I think you can, just look at the documentation in LTK or like you can use Stack Overflow. Yeah, if you're just like developing on your own, you don't have to memorize how to use every single function in your library. You just have to learn how to like look for it when you need it, like probably through Google or something. Um, yeah, so I have this stop words and I think the reason I converted it to a set is because, oh, what is this? Name, stop words is not the Oh, <laughs> okay. Thanks for spotting that. Uh, yeah. So let me just run this. I think so this is a list. Yeah. So this is a list, and I want to convert it to a set. So I think let me delete this cell. So um, let me just explain what a set is. So okay. So the reason I converted it into a set is like let's say your data size is very big, and you want to check if like an item is in a list. So if you want to check if an item is a list, the basically part what Python has to do is to go through every single element in that item and then I have to check. Um, so, so the runtime will be a slightly slower. So I converted it to a set. So a set is kind of like a, uh, you won't have to, in, in Python, a set like, is, is in a standard library. You don't have to import anything. And um, basically, if you have done 2040 already, it's basically a hash set. But if you have not done 2040, um, basically I will not have any duplicates within the set. And then I can quickly check if an item is in the set, like in constant time. So yeah, uh, I will use a set for this. And then I also want to work counter. So for this counter, I will um, use the collections, which is in the standard library. And then the, 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 the standard library has this counter object, which is very convenient to use. So uh, let me just show you what it does. So let's say I have a string. Um, let me think. Uh, yeah, so let's say you want to quickly count like what's the characters in a string. Like, you know, in other languages, you probably have to like create, you probably need five lines at least, but in Python, you import and then one line is done. So. It's one of the great things of Python. So basically this counter object counts things that's like in a, you know, whatever object that it passes you, it's in passing to the counter. So I, I initialize the empty counter at first. And this counter is basically, as you just saw just now, it's a dictionary, but with some extra functions uh, added to the dictionary to make it more powerful. Um, yeah, and so just now we have text raw, right? So text raw is uh, just now as we see, it's just one paragraph of all the paragraphs uh, concatenated together. So I want this paragraph to be like a list of words instead. So um, just, just now in NLTK, we imported word tokenize, which does this automatically for us. You don't have to use NLTK for this. I mean, if you are good at programming, you can like try to separate all, all the comma spaces or this, but yeah, so we won't do that here. So we just use word tokenize. And you know, if you inspect words, yeah, you have this list of, um, including punctuation marks as you see sadly. So we'll be so, we'll sort that out later. Um, yeah, so now I have words, right? So which is this array of words. Um, now, as you can see, just now we have punctuation and stuff. So 
uh, now I want to remove words that are like just uh, not alphabetical words, which are like punctuation numbers and stuff. Because I mean, I can't, I can't really substitute a, 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 like a, a number or something. So if the word is not in the stop words, which are the words I want to remove, they are not important. And also if the word is alphabetical, um, then I will increment the counter for that word. So uh, as you can see, I think, so I think in normal Python, you cannot do this, but counter is like a instance of default ditch. So if I don't have this key in this dictionary, I will automatically, um, the default value will be zero. So I, I won't have the key error or something, but I think if you use a normal dictionary, if you just do this like this, you might run into key error. So now if you inspect counter, um, oh yeah, I already have this. I already have this one. Yeah, you can see uh, I have this uh, dictionary of asteroid used 10 times, Earth used nine times, or this. Yeah, so I have, uh, so now I have my counter. And so now I want to, uh, oh, actually, yeah. So now you can see it's counter is kind of in sorted order. Um, I'm not sure if, I can't remember if this is like a property of the counter object, but usually uh, in Python, if you just use a normal dictionary, I don't think it will be sorted for you automatically. Um, so which is why I did the next cell to basically sort it by count, right? So, um, if yeah, so again, Python has some very uh, concise syntax to do this. So first, I convert. So, um, I, so so how should I go about this? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So for for your dictionary, right? You can know that there's a key and there's a value. So the key is like the the word, and then the value is the number of times it appears. So. Uh, if you call dot items for any dictionary in Python, it will give you the iterator to uh, the key and value pairs. So I iterate over all the key and value pairs in counter, which is uh, for this case is word and count. And then I will in invert the order. Yeah, I will invert the order. So I put count first. So this way, when I sort it, I will sort it by count. So if I think if you don't do this, then maybe it will sort it by alphabetical first, then after that count. But I want the count to be sorted first. The primary sorting key, right? So now I will sort it in descending order. So uh, in descending order in Python, you just put reverse into true. And then uh, this dot sort will sort it in place. And now you can print it and yep. So now I have this pairs of um, the, word, the word count followed by the word. Yep. So uh, now, okay, so now let's see now you want to find synonyms for the word, like just to suggest. Um, so I think, uh, one of the ways you can go about doing it is you can go through like you find a thesaurus or a dictionary online dictionary and they might have an api for this but you have probably have to sign up for api key and then and stuff so uh, probably a bit more uh, difficult to uh, maybe you have to do a bit of like processing um for the, like the the the, the request like the, the object that you get back you probably have to do a bit of processing to get back the actual um list of synonyms um but I think that the sort of benefit of doing this is that the words probably might be, um, the synonyms that you get might be higher quality and maybe it'll be better updated. But yeah, for the context of this workshop, I won't go through how like setting up this like API because you probably have to sign up for the API key and stuff. Um, yeah, and I think uh, I, when I Google for, so, so basically when you do things in, in software engineering, you just try to Google for how to do things. And I think when I Google for how to, um, Get synonyms in Python. Uh, one of the things that popped up, popped up was like this Py Pythosaurus, which I think was deprecated. So currently, I think when I Google for let's say uh yeah, yeah so when I get synonyms or word, so I just basically Google and then I will get to Stack Overflow and so they will say, Oh, I have this in NLTK already. So um yeah, so I don't have to, which is great because I already have NLTK just now. So I don't have to do any like other API, use any other API or install any other library. So, but as you can see slightly later, I think the NLTK, um, their synonyms are maybe not the best. Yeah, so, but anyway, um, let's go through. So we download this, following, following just now the, 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 the stack overflow, we download. Okay, first of all, we have to import one net and then uh, if you just import it without these two lines, I think it will show some kind of error. So 
you fix the error by just downloading all the data sets. And this is downloaded. So, and now I just want, uh, so for each of the words in the, so from the most overused word onwards, and then I will get, so I, I, I will get the synonyms. Okay, so this is, this is again like a lot of like, I think NLP jargon. So let's just, let's go to this page. So a scene set is basically a set of synonyms that share a common meaning. Um, and then each scene set contains one or more lemmas, which represent a specific sense of a specific word. Okay, but you don't have to understand any of this. You can just uh, try to like play around with the code, like type in the code and see what it does. So um, yeah, so <laughs> um, basically a scene set is like a, like a set of words that are like kind of like in common in meaning. And then for each of the sets, I want to print out the names in that set. And I would add the name to synonyms. And the reason I use set here is so that I remove any duplicates. Because I think if you do this without, if you, like, if you use a list instead, I think you'll get a lot of duplicate names. So easy way to remove duplicates is just to use a set. And yeah, and if, if, you, if you do it like, if you, if, you, if you just run these few lines, you'll notice that the original word is also in the synonym set, which doesn't make sense. So I will just remove the original word. And so in Python, I think uh, there's a, in the, the set has also a dot remove uh, method. So dot, dot remove will throw an error if the key doesn't exist. So that's uh, very convenient for you. Python has another method called discard, which like will remove if the key is there, but if the key is not there, it won't throw any error. And after, after you run this, uh, I'm just running for Yeah, so you get some, uh, so you use 10 times and then synonyms. Um, so this, uh, this is called a ternary operator in Python. So um, I will check if the synonyms is empty. So if it's empty, I will print none. And then if it's not empty, I will just give the original synonyms. <laughs> So, yeah, I, um, I mean, in this example, the I think the words are somewhat scientific, so maybe uh, not the best example, but then again, I can see like um, some of the, the synonyms don't really make any sense. Uh, yeah, but so this, just, this is just one example. I think um, uh, like a slightly better way to do it probably is to like find a third party API, or like a, one of the dictionary websites or thesaurus, and then you try to, call like the API, try to call like the, yeah. So probably a slightly better way to do it. But this this method will work out of the box without like any other setup. Like you can just use NLTK for this. Um, yeah, but I think, yeah. Okay, so back to the slides. <clears throat> Let me see what's the time. One, okay, 11. Okay, so um, I'll just go through one last example of like reading and writing files, which is got to do with images. But before I go into that, I want to run into a bit of like, just a bit more background on like how to handle images in Python or programming in general. So the way images are represented digitally is that uh, I can specify an amount of, so they're, usually they are specified like RGB. So um, sometimes you'll come into RGB A, so the additional A stands for alpha, which is the transparency. So, each of these components are is a, usually an integer from zero to two five five, but sometimes, uh, some weird library you might get zero to one or like some other, but usually it's zero to two five five, and usually uh the last, the alpha will probably be zero to one or maybe zero to hundred based on what kind of like percentage whether they're going by percentage or they're going by decimal, <clears throat> yeah. But basically transparency. So zero means uh completely transparent and one means uh, fully opaque. And so each of the, so an image is basically a 2D, two dimension um, array. And then each of these ar array has a value of RGBA. And then this RGBA is, stands for the individual, the individual pixel color. Uh, yeah, so if you use, uh, I, think, I think probably most installations of Python, it should come with Pillow, uh, which is the Python image library. So if it doesn't come with it, then um, you can just quickly install it for whichever package manager you're using. And so the if you use like the this image library, uh, you'll notice that the coordinates are like not really um 
it's, it's, it's not really, it's kind of fixed from the original like x, y coordinates you get from like doing graphs or in mathematics. So the origin is the top left corner. And then when you go like in the normal x, the x axis works as normal, but the y axis, there's no negative sign, I think. Uh, so when you go in a positive y direction, it will just go downwards. So that's just one of the quirks, I think. And I think I think this is also quite common in like sometimes you work with UI. I think they might also use this kind of notation, the the, the top top left corner being the the origin. Yeah. Okay. So box tuple. Um. So it, like like this this I think this is just like specific for pillow, but um maybe if you're working in some other library and you want to specify like an area of the image, maybe it's some other notation, but. For pillow, um, you will specify the left edge, the top edge, and the right edge, and the bottom edge. So, and then, so like, can you see from this example, I have, yeah, so this box will be represented by three, one, the top edge, and nine, and six. Yeah, okay, so the demo. So, if, if, if sometimes you, um, yeah, so I'm, I think I think usually this collect instances last for very eight hours or something. So um if you sometimes when you come back the next day, then you might not be connected and just need to reconnect it. And then so if if it's not connect, like say, say you come back the next day, if it disconnects, you will lose all the uh the current memory of all the cells that are being run. So you have to probably have to rerun it again. So in this in this instance, I have to rerun this. So if you I think if you open files, you can see there's no I don't have this automation in Python, so you have to reclone this. And after we clone, so I have, now I have this folder, and yeah, I import the same path lib again, and I import this pillow library, and so now I want to work with another image in this um, sample data, which is see that's one image of a cat here, and yeah, so now I want to get this path, so I basically go into so this whole current working directory, I go into all the subfolders, navigate data, images, cat.jpg. And now I want to open this image. So just now from pillow, we imported this class called uh, image. So image has this uh this uh this 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 function called open. So I just need to pass in the path. And as I said just now, um, even though this is a path object. Uh, most of the Python standard libraries nowadays they are they work with path objects. You don't have to change it to a string. So, just to show what I mean, uh, this you can see is a, is a path object. And so, if you're working with some other maybe updated library, you might have to change this to a string. Just wrap it in this, I think. And then now I will get a string of this. So, yeah, both of both of this will work for standard library. But yeah, just in case you're using some third party library that doesn't accept public, then you need to change it to a string. <clears throat> okay, so I open this image. And then now in I think in this uh terminal, so in, in this Jupyter notebook, I think I can just display this image. So um let's see what happens if I print it. I think you should tell me it's a pillow instance. Yeah, so you see, if I, when I print it, it will tell me that this is uh, some kind of class. So this, this is an instance of this object called JPEG image file mode uh, RGB size. So when you open the size, uh, sorry, when you inspect the size uh, attribute, it will tell you the width and height. Yeah, and then I can do some simple transformations, like I can rotate it. So I can rotate it by, um, you know, anti-clockwise or clockwise. I think this is uh, anti-clockwise. So it goes by... Oh, sorry, this is clockwise. <laughs> yeah, negative 10. Uh, yeah, so I rotate it clockwise. I can, so if, let's say I will, after I rotate it, I want to remove all these black triangles here. I can crop it. And now when I crop it, uh, yeah, I have it cropped. So even though like it looks like slightly rotated. Um, so actually, I just now I think the rotation was to fix the angle. So I want the cat to be vertical. And after I rotate it, I can crop it. and yeah, so now I, after I, I manually, so after I change all this image, actually this image is only in my memory. So if the image is in my memory, uh, after I close this notebook, after I close the Python program, or after the Python program exits, 
uh, this image, the, 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 the disk will not be changed. So like the image in the disk is still there and nothing will happens to the original image. So I want to save this image from memory to disk. And how I do that is, um, I mean, same thing, you can, you, try to, you can override the original image, but um, usually, I mean, I refrain from overwriting the original data just in case like a bug happens or something, then I lose my original data. So I will create output directory again. And so I will make, so now I create two new folders. So I, I specify parents equals to true so I can create any parent folders. And yeah, so my output directory is here. And then now I save it so I can, uh, so this instance of this object has a function called save, which I just, again, specify this path, uh, crop.jpg, which um, is the file name that I want to save under. And then now if you open this, you get this image which is saved. And then the original image should still be there, like the original taller image. Yeah. Okay. So, um, just uh, so what, one of the things that you might run into if you're working with images is that, uh, like say you're working with images in like a machine learning context, and then you want to transfer like a data set over to from maybe uh your local laptop to over to some GPU server to do some processing, and you might notice that uh, so images sometimes the in the data sets they add up to maybe a few hundred gigabytes, and then if you want to transfer it over in the original size, it can be very prohibitively, um, it can take very long because like. Yeah, the network transfer for few hundred gigabytes. might take of, I'm not sure what what's the network speed nowadays, but yeah, it it could take quite long. So one of the things you can do is uh you can try to resize the image, uh and also one of the benefits of resizing is that um like if you're doing like some kind of deep learning processing on this image, it will be a bit you run a bit faster on a smaller image compared to a bigger image. So um. Yeah, you can, you can just pre-process the entire image data set so you can transfer it over the network and then you can um, run your whatever models you have. Uh, and then these models will probably run um, slightly cheaper because the image is smaller. So now I'll, uh, I'll go through an example to how to resize all the images. So um, I will just specify this output path, which I want it to be, I think, uh, let me see. The, oh, sorry, this input, input path. Uh, input path is uh, data images and then I think this is the, the Stanford car data set, which uh, has all these cars, as you can see. Um, yeah, so I think this data set is under like some research license, so please don't use it for commercial purposes. Um, yeah, uh, and so now I want to resize all these images from the original sizes, which I think are pretty big. I'm not sure, I think it should be about 700 pixels. And I want to resize it to 200, maximum dimension of 200. So I can, so uh, for each image path in, so I got all the images that end with JPEG and I open, for each image, I will open it. And if the image size, which is just now you see is width and height. So if either dimension, so the, the biggest of the dimensions is bigger than the resize dimension, which is 200, I will resize it. So how I resize it is basically, I will multiply it by a ratio. So, um, you can see I how how this works is basically uh, I divide it by divide the width or height by the maximum of the image size and then I multiply it by two hundred, which will give me like maximum of two hundred for each dimension, and then so I get the new width for width times ratio and height times ratio, and then this might be a decimal point so of, of floating of sorry this this might be a decimal point, so I will cast it to an integer so I don't want a decimal point. Because I don't think you can have like half a pixel in in JPEG, saved in like as a, as a JPEG. So afterwards, I resize to this new dimension and I will save the output. Okay, so output directory is here, and then now if I refresh this, so now I if I inspect the same image again, you see it, I, now it's it's like two hundred pixels maximum. So um, yeah, 200 pixels, I think should be still refined for most um, machine learning models and stuff. So it's a good kind of dimension to work with. And also like you can just transfer it over SSH or okay, SCP or whatever quite fast. Yeah, okay. So um, the next part of the workshop, I think Chris will be going through. Um, yeah, we'll be going through web scraping with beautiful soup, which is I think quite interesting as well.
All right. Okay. Yeah. So I hope the Zoom can hear me. Wait, let me check my mic. Okay, the Zoom can hear me. Awesome. Yeah, so um gonna move on. Yeah, so um earlier on in the first part of the workshop, of course, uh Itao taught you guys about you know uh, more advanced Python functionality, and he combined them to show you how to do things like image manipulation. But in the second part, I'm gonna show you how to do some web scraping. Okay, so uh this web scraping use case that I, I kind of came up with is a pretty bizarre use case. And I think a lot of you guys would like kind of like like laugh at it when you realize what I used it for. So yeah, um what I want to say in this workshop is that when we was when me and Itao we were first asked to run this automation workshop um three years ago. This is actually the third time I'm teaching this, third time in three years. Um it was always very difficult for us to come up with like to think about you know what to present for automation because it's not like there's not there's no like general use case that kind of that kind of works for everyone you see it's not there's not uh, automation that would be useful for everyone because if such a thing exists somebody will already made a business with it and you guys will all be using it right so point is when we join a workshop such as uh, this workshop automation in python you need to realize that automation is something that's very personal right and today what we are coming here to do is we're really here to pick up the skills that um, from me and Ethel's experience, the things that we have tried to automate for ourselves, we hope that the skills will be relevant to you guys when eventually um, you guys figure out what you need to automate. So that's the goal here, right? So story time of this whole story behind the, the behind the telegram chat, uh, web scraping thing. So why am I presenting this today? I can tell you the story of it. And the story is basically... Once upon a time, I was uh, I was uh, taking this module in school. Then you know, in school projects, you have people who do not do work. So I needed to do a peer review on that teammate of mine, and I wanted to show the prof that he didn't do work, right? So what is one of the means that I can use to like show that that guy really didn't like contribute much to the group project? So what I did was I exported the Telegram group chat from my um, group project and then I really just showed him the bar graph of like how many messages everybody sent then of course the slacker is this guy over here <laughs> and yeah I mean I don't know what happened to that guy but I got a good grade for the for the mod la. so you see that this is what I mean by when I say like automation is very personal right it's really up to you guys to think about what you wanted to like use like python to help you to do okay so this today what we're gonna go through is something very similar what we're gonna go through is uh, we're gonna um we i've actually exported the entire nus hackers chat and we're gonna like do something similar we're gonna like download all the messages uh try to like plot a bar graph of like who is the who are the people who talk for nus hackers chat the most so nus hackers chat is this telegram group chat that uh nus hackers users we talk about events talk about hacking anything uh, if you haven't joined, you should, but no worries. Uh, the, the files are already prepared for you guys. Okay, so um, I'm going to just quickly show you a few pictures on how you can do this, okay? Also, on the Windows Telegram client, uh, I think this only works on Windows. Uh, it doesn't work on Mac, so I actually had to like use my Windows machine to export it. So you can go to like a Telegram group here, and then you can just click on the export chat history button. And what happens is that you will see this dialog box here. This dialog box here will let you choose uh, what you want to export. So, um, you know, uh, right now, now that you know that this feature exists, if you wanted to like archive some of your favorite chats with like your friends or something, just in case things get lost, you can do so as well, right? So just take what you want to export, photos, videos, and then like set the size limit, and then you'll just export it. So, in the end, after you export it, this is what you see. You see a folder with like uh, this few HTML files here. So um, HTML might be something you, new to you guys. I'm gonna talk briefly talk about what it's about as well. So yeah, let's see how it looks like now. So just today at like 12 a.m., I exported NUS Hackers Chat. And then when you double click on one of these files, it will actually open up in your web browser, okay? So make it bigger for you guys. This is like essentially a, immortalize uh, chat history of like your chat group, okay? So this is from the very start of NUS Hackers Chat. NUS Hackers Chat, I think has like 
1.5k members now. This was when we first created in 2019. So yeah, um, now we're gonna like try to use Python to kind of like read it and do some processing on it, okay? So open the collab notebook here. I've been showing the link here. You guys should have it open now and we're gonna like do some funky stuff with it, okay? So like I said, when we open up this, what you see is like, what you see is uh, this HTML file, right? But HTML files, you can see it actually opens up your web browser. So HTML is a hypertext markup language, which is meaningless jargon to you guys, but what it means is actually, it's just a set of characters that kind of tell the web browser how to like display certain content, okay? So I, if, I, I, if, if I right click this and I click inspect, right? What you see is uh you see uh over here you have like opening okay actually uh, let me see if I can hide this okay what you want to be focused on is this you see like opening text closing text and then it says NUS hackers chat but because over here when the, the developers of Telegram coded it they wanted it to be displayed as text bold then they will just put text bold here which is why it looks like that so you can think about HTML as like um it's like code that kind of tells the web browser how to display certain structured content, okay? So we're gonna make use of this structure to kind of help us to pick out certain data. Um, back to my slides. Yeah, so um, we are not gonna go super in-depth into HTML today, but if you want, if you would like to learn more about HTML and CSS, uh, it helps you if you want to learn how to become like a web developer, for example. But what we need today is really just to understand what HTML is about. But if you want to do so, you can attend the HTML CSS Hacker School on week seven on 1st October. Okay, so yeah, uh, notebook, quick notebook demo. Um, I'm gonna open up the notebook. Right, so I hope it's uh, big enough for the people here. Right, so uh, same thing as what Ital has shown. Uh, when you open up a, 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 this collab notebook here, you can really just use it to run like Python code. In fact, this Python code is running on Google servers. Uh, but you, it's Google is just making this service free for you to like run code and see certain code outputs here. So right now I don't have like the files here, right? So what you can do is you just run this git clone command. So this git clone command, what you need to know is it, again, it just downloads all the file we need for this workshop. And after you run this command, you see that uh, we have the hacker school data here as well as, uh, as, well as uh, the chat export. So this is the chat history that I've exported uh, just this morning today. Okay, so um, earlier on, it also talked about file globbing. So now what we want to look at is you want to look at all the HTML files. So I'm going to import the globbing library and we will just like, okay, we'll just like navigate to this hacker school slash web scripting slash chat export, right? So hacker school slash web scripting slash chat export, and then we put star.html. So what this star.html means is that uh, we want all the HTML files, but we don't care what the name is. Okay, star is like a wildcard. Star just means like it can be anything. But as long as it ends with dot HTML, I want it. Okay, then I, if I want to, to run this, then you'll see, okay, um, Python actually look for all the files. And right now we see Python has recognized that there, that there are like 21 files that we are looking at. Okay, then yeah, of course you can just run a length on it to see how many files there are, 21 files, right? So when we try to like look at such files that has like structured data, we kind of need to look at the shape of it first. And how we can do that is we can just look at the file itself okay you can open this file in like your your visual studio code or whatever or your text editor your favorite text editor some like to use nano some like to use vim or emacs whatever whatever can open like text files right so but today today we're just gonna like show the first 20 lines of like the file so same as what it went through just now just open the file and you print the first 20 lines and you see like okay this is like probably some like um, code looking thing that you are not too familiar with because uh, most of you might not have heard of HTML before. Right, so this is HTML. I talked about what it's about. Um, so when we, so 
HTML is not related to Python, right? HTML is just one of the ways uh, modern web browsers use to display and to like understand web pages. But because right now we are using Python to try to like process it, we also need a library to help us to look at this HTML file. Okay, so the one of the most famous libraries that people use for web scraping to process HTML files is this Python library called Beautiful Soup. Okay, um, don't ask me why it's named like that. It's a funky name, but uh, usually most of the web scraping libraries they, they just call it soup. So in like Java, the Java web scraping library is called J Soup, for example. But Python they name it Beautiful Soup, lah. Okay, so um. <laughs> It's already pre-installed in like uh, Collab, so you can just import it directly. So I'm going to use Beautiful Soup to just open like one, the, the very first file that I just showed you, messages.html. So this was like the first ever messages that were sent when NUS Hackers Chat were created. Okay, so after I run it, uh, Beautiful Soup basically provides us methods to query certain parts of that file. Okay. Query certain parts of that file. So now what we are interested in is like the names of the people who have sent that message, right? So yeah, we want to be able to pro programmatically get okay, Francis Lee, NUS hackers, Christopher Go, NUS hackers, and so on and so forth. We're interested in these names. So for us to be able to pick out that that thing that tells people that okay, this is the name of of like a, the person who sent the message, just right click the name, click on inspect. And what you will see is that uh, when the developers of Telegram, they have created this tool, right? All the names of people, in, all the names of people, they're actually marked with this thing called from name, okay? This is a CSS class, okay? Cascading style sheet, uh, you don't really need to know what that is, but I'm just telling you, cascading style sheet class that, you know, tells the web browser, okay, if this is a name, I want it to be displayed in blue color and in certain font, etc. But all the names here are marked with this class called from name. So you see Francis' name is marked with from name. If you look at my name, I right click, I inspect. It's also, it's also marked with class equals to from name. Okay, so this is something you can do with like your favorite websites as well. You can go to like Straits Times or any other website, just right click and inspect. And you can kind of see like how they, they craft this web page and how, what styles they use to like give it like a blue color or something like that. But either way, we, we found out that, okay, in this exported chat message, every single name is marked with this class called from name. And that helps us to come up with a basis of how to pick out all the names, right? So, back to this, okay, what we want to do is we want to select all the CSS class names called from name, okay, and over here you see I use soup.select, how did I know to use this method called soup.select, right, so as like what Ital mentioned, whenever you are lost, always just Google for people, Google for how to do it, and if you read like the beautiful soup documentation, so whenever you use any third party libraries, uh, most of them will provide like documentation on how you should use the library. So this is essentially like a tutorial on how you can use it, right? So they'll say quick start and like, uh, you can like just uh, import the library and then like run certain functions to prettify the file and how to navigate that data structure. Okay, so, what I was looking for is just uh, CSS selectors, okay? So if you want to search for text that match two or more CSS classes, you should use a CSS selector. So, which is how I knew that, okay? After looking at the documentation, what I need to do is I need to call the dot select method inside Beautiful Soup. And I just need to provide it with the name of the class, okay? So in this case, the example they gave was, okay, there's this paragraph tag, okay, and this has a class called body strikeout. And then you just kind of like uh, paragraph dot strikeout dot body, and this is able to select this HTML tag. Okay, but anyway, the work is done. So what we did was select the from name class, and I'm just going to show you the first 10, right? First 10, this is, we basically narrowed it down to like the HTML nodes. The, the HTML 
portions that tell you where the names are. And now you can see Francis, NUS Hackers, Christopher Go, blah, blah, blah. And it's still a little bit messy, right? So let's just try to extract the name. So if you look at, if you look at this, right, this is actually a list of 10 items for now. And you see this comma here. This comma means that, okay, this is the first item. This is the second item. This is the third item and so on. Okay. And from reading the beautiful soup documentation, if you wanted to get the text content of every single um, beautiful soup note, right? What uh, we can do is we can just call this uh, attribute called dot contents. Okay. Dot contents. So dot contents really just uh, selects the, okay. So from the list of stuff we, we got, the, the list of notes we got, uh, what we, we are looking at the third item here and we want to get like the contents of it, the very first content. And then we are, okay, so if I run it without the dot strip, then of course it will look like something like this with like some new lines before and before and after. So of course I will, I will add like the dot strip. And this helps me to just get just the name itself. Okay, so now that we know how we can get like the names very cleanly. And we already have a list of all the nodes here. With Python, it makes it very easy for us to just get the names of every single message, right? So we use a list comprehension here. So we first select everything that's the from name. And for every node, okay, for every div, okay, we, we call it a div in HTML because uh, um, what you see over here, these are all div elements. So for every div, we, we get the contents and we strip the names, okay? And there you see it. You see all the names here uh, of every single message, all the names that appear on like the chat log over there, okay? So next, right? So now, now that uh, I've, I've reached this portion, uh, if anybody is lost or anything, feel free to ask any questions, but we have a small exercise to do here, okay? Uh, you can just like run all the cells up to you here. And the next exercise I would like you guys to do is, there are a lot of names here, right? So a lot of these names are repeated. How do you get a list of unique names in the chat? And how do you count how many unique names you have? Okay, I'm going to give you guys about two minutes to like try this out. Then two minutes later, we'll like move on. Okay, yeah. Feel free to ask any questions in the Zoom chat or for those who are here, just feel free to ask me any questions as well. Okay, another minute to go. I will continue at 11.37.
Okay, I will carry on. So for those of you guys who are stuck or you are done, you can just look back at my screen. Uh, I see uh, those on the Zoom. Uh, okay, so yeah. Um, yep, you can you can use a uh, NumPy unique or you can use set as well. Uh, yeah, so if you look at raw names over here, right? Raw names, there's a lot of duplicates. And if I look at the type of raw names, okay? If I print out the type, of uh, raw names, what you see is that raw names is actually a list, and list actually allows us to have like duplicate elements. And like what Ital has talked about earlier, if you wanted to get like just unique elements, you can just put it to a set. And when you put it to a set, uh, it will try to deduplicate everything for you, and all you get here is like I like unique names. Okay, so. That's for the first challenge. And how do you count how many unique names you have? So of course, now that you have like the unique names, uh, you can just to get like how to get how many unique names you have, you can just call length on, on this. And you see that for the very first file, we had 66 people talking in like the chat. Right? So we managed to use Python to help us count how many people have spoken in our chat group here. Uh, and that was just a really short introduction to like the powers of beautiful soup, right? But let's get back to our task. We need to count how many messages each user has sent, right? We are not interested in like, okay, there's 66 people who talk. We are interested in uh, how many uh, messages Stephen has sent, how many messages uh, Itao has sent, okay? So if you look at raw names itself, okay, this is the first 15 elements, right? Uh, can you just take raw names and count it? And then you get like the right number of messages that each user has sent. Okay. And if you look at closely, you, you kind of need to compare it to the data that you have, right? So if you we see Francis, NS hackers, Christopher Go, NS hackers, NS hackers, uh what you see is uh okay, this is not a super good example. Okay, uh, actually, no, I can't, I, I don't think it's easy for me to find an example for this now. But if you look at this, if we were to just count the names that appear, right? If we were to just count the names that appear, it would look like Chris just sent two messages because the name appears here once, the name appears here two, two like the second time. But what in actual fact, what I've done was I actually sent four messages, right? So I just sent four messages. You, you see like this timestamp here, this timestamp here, each of these is like one individual message. So if we were to just count by the names itself, this will actually give us a wrong count. But what we actually want to happen is we want to count the messages itself, okay? So, so how do we do that? We kind of need to count individual messages. So again, we will just like right click and inspect, right? And what you realize is that, okay, so if, if I right click the time here, you only see the time, but you kind of need to go up until you see like the whole message is highlighted. Okay, I repeat, if I were to inspect the time, it will only give me the HTML node for the time. But if I want to see the whole message, I need to like go up one level until, go up two levels actually, until like you, it highlights the whole message, right? So this is how I look at individual messages in terms of HTML, okay? You see all of this, as I move them down, it highlights the next message, highlights the next message, and so on and so forth. So that's the methodology I want to use to count it. And right now, if I were to just, okay, I, I think I skipped that, I didn't explain this, but, if you look at all the messages, right? All the messages here, they have the CSS class name called um, message and default, okay? But we, are, we also want to ensure that we account for our example there, which is uh, the ones with like multiple messages. Uh, yeah, okay, let's look at this. So this is the one that has like multiple messages, right? And what you can see here is, um,
yeah, what you can see here is like they are all like message default as well. So, uh, in fact, all these all these um new join messages they have a new class name called join, which is something we could use as well, right? But actually, what we can do is we can just select all the messages by the the class name message and default, and this is what I did. Okay, so you just select by message or default, and you can look at the first three messages, and this is what the first three messages look like. Um. Okay, it's a, a bit messy here, right? So, okay, so uh, for us to make better sense of it, what you want to see is like the, the top again. So the first three messages is hello world, NUS hackers, wow, hackers chat exciting, right? So what we see here is, uh, you see the comma here? So this is actually the third message, third message. So. What we want to do is like we kind of need to know how to process each of them. So we will just like look at one message by itself. And one message, okay, there's a lot of things here. And um again, we, we will do the same thing here. We'll just like take the select the just the one message itself and select the, the from name, and we'll just like get the name itself. Right? So this is what this is uh, what we have done so far. We kind of combine them. So instead of selecting the just the from name, we select the messages. Then from the messages, we select the from name. And now what we want to do is we want to print every messages sender. Okay. And you will realize this actually gives you a bug. Right? You try to print every messages sender. So for when you get every single message, you look through every individual message. And for every individual message, you try to print the sender, uh, you realize that after Ryan and Herbert, then there's like a list index out of range, right? So uh, back to this, uh, Ryan and Herbert. Uh, hmm, this is strange. Oh yeah, okay. So after Ryan and Herbert, it actually crashes over here. Then you then the, the next question will be like, why that happens, right? So where is this? Okay, yeah. So after Ryan and Herbert, then you say it crashes. It says list index out of range. And what this tells me is that, okay, uh, either this is broken or this is broken. And I think in this case, it's likely for it to be this because it's very likely that for that very specific message itself, okay, for this me specific message over here, this secondary message, it cannot find a from name. So if you, if you cannot find a from name and you try to like get the first item from the list, right? Then of course it will crash, right? So we need to go about a smarter way to, to do this. And if you look at the, if you print out all the from name from all the messages, you realize that uh, a lot of them actually don't have, um, a, a lot of them are actually um, don't have a name here. But only but only those that where you see like there, there are actually names, then you see like the name show up. Okay. So we basically need to do a check here, right? To first try to select the sender from every single message. Okay. Number one, we from every single message we select the sender. But if we identify a sender, then we'll be able to do something to it. But if we don't identify a sender, we'll just print like someone send this. Okay, so this is what you end up seeing. You end up seeing like okay, uh, Julius, then someone send this. You see um, uh, um, Alvin Ho, and then like someone send this. But because we are looking at, at our chat log, we, can, we know that when you say someone send this, this is actually sent by the last name that you saw, right? Right? So. We, are, we all need to do something different here, which is we want to change all the someone send this to the last seen name, okay? So that's the next challenge that we'll try out here. So for the next uh, two minutes, I'll let you guys try. Let's change all the someone send this to the, like, the last seen name, okay? So you guys have two minutes to try it out now. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask.
Okay, so yeah, I guess you guys can come back to look at my screen now. Uh, yeah, so for this, this exercise, right, for those who are already familiar with programming, of course, you'll find this very easy, but of course, this workshop, we try to cater it like to like a beginner level, right? So what we want, the, our goal here is to change all of this, like someone sent this to the last scene name, right? So whenever we see like an actual name, we what we, want, what we want to do is we actually want to save it somewhere. So usually you will just save it to last scene send, sender. Okay, just create like a variable for it, right? Then if the message has no sender, then of course you print the last scene sender. Then uh Okay, so what you want to do is you want to save it so that when it has it doesn't know what the sender is, it will just like print out the last scene sender. Then uh of course over here you kind of need to like declare the the variable to just be at, at the start you have nothing, right? So you you just print none, like just set it to none. Um yeah, so now this has changed slightly. Uh everything, all the um all the someone send this has been replaced to like the last scene name over here. All right, so um, okay, I'm gonna make this code slightly nicer because you see this if else branch, both of them, uh, actually, uh, do the same thing, right? So what usually what you want to do is you just want to move it out. So you move it out, and then only if there is a sender, then you will save the last scene sender. Okay, so that's like something that you can do to like make your code look nicer okay so only if there's a sender then you set the last scene sender but in both cases you print the last scene sender right okay so now that we know how to get the right names associated with each message we can finally try to count them okay we can finally try to count them so uh same as before uh, we have our last scene sender we also create like a list an empty list that allows us to store all the names. So uh, if, there are, if there's no sender, then we will just append like the last scene sender. But if there is a sender, then you set like the last scene sender and then you append it as well. Okay, so actually this one you can take out also outside of the if else. But this works the same way. Lah. So we'll just run this. And what you see right now is that we actually have a list, okay? The difference between this and what we saw just now was that the, the previous one, we just printed it out. But now we're actually saving it to like a list. So this list helps us to do some data processing for, to it, for it, to it. Okay, so uh, for us to do like a sanity check to see whether like um, it's all correctly tagged, right? What you're interested to see is uh, whether the length of all the names you have is the same as the length of like the number of messages that you have. So if this shows true, then of course like it's correct. Okay. So now that we have a proper list of names, then what how do we count it, right? So if you want to count it, um there are a lot of data processing libraries you can use, or you could even just not use a library and just like write basic Python to try to count it yourself. Or just or even just pass it into collections counter, right? I can just uh from collections import counter and then I will just call counter on all names and this also gives you like a count of everything this this works you don't you don't even have to use a, like a library for it but just for like to show you guys the ease of like using python libraries to do certain things right I've imported this library called pandas so pandas is a very powerful and popular data wrangling library in python Okay, uh, this, li this library makes it very easy for us to count stuff. So there's this thing called a data frame in, in Pandas. You don't really, okay, we don't need to cover in depth for this workshop, but data frame, you can kind of think about it as like a spreadsheet. Okay, and if I were to just pass in all names and I looked at the, I look at the data frame, you can, you see this very nice interactive uh, tabular data. Okay, so right now our data is put inside a table. and uh, Pandas actually exposes this thing called um, this method. They, they have a lot of very fancy methods that help us do certain things. And one of them is value counts. 
So this DF0, what it means is just a DF, the data frame on top, this data frame. I want to select the row that the, the very first row. So this rows, no, this column zero. Okay, column zero. Then I want to get like the value counts. Okay. And what you see here is you see this uh fancy formatted string that tells you okay how we send 131 messages and like uh Jetro send 83 messages and so on and so forth. Okay, so just different ways of doing the same thing. But the very fancy thing of us using um pandas is it actually helps us to very easily plot graphs. Okay, so Right, like right now, imagine your boss wants to see your work, right? It's very ugly if you just send this to him like that because you know how people always like to see like, like graphs and stuff. So what you can do is you can just select select the data, you get the value counts, and then you call a, a function called dot plot on it. So dot plot is uh dot plot is a method that like the pandas exposes that helps you to just plot like a graph. Okay, and that's we kind of did it, right? It's just like um for the very first file, just messages.html, we plot like the number of messages everybody sent, and then the name is like on the x-axis. Okay, my name is over here, Chris. Okay? I think that's me. No, my this is me, Christopher Go over here. Yeah. Okay, so are we done yet? And of course, what you what like what I just mentioned, we only did it on like one out of 22 files, right? But the thing is, you need to realize, right, this is Python. You already wrote code to kind of do the hard work for you. And if you're able to do it on just one file, it means you can do it on 22 files very easily, right? So remember at the start, we clock all the HTML files. And over here, you see uh, you have like uh, messages until messages20.html. Now, what we need to do is we need to repeat the whole process, but for the whole 20 files, 31 files. Right, so uh, very easily what you do is like, you really just um, again have like a list of all names. Then you, we, we also just look through all the files and for every single, single file, right? From the top all the way to what we've done so far, we just put it inside the for loop. So use beautiful soup to process each individual file. Then we select all the messages, then we also process every individual messages, right? And just like do the, the your, your all names append thingy. And what you realize is that if you process all 21 files, this takes a while to run because I think it, it needs to read all 21 files. Yeah, there are 20,471 messages, right? And over here, I also, just for sanity check, I also like kept a message counter. So whenever I looked at look at every individual file's messages, I'll just add like just count how many messages I've processed so far. And of course, these two numbers should match, right? So length of the all names and length of the message counter is the same. Okay, and then we do the exact same thing. Okay, again, you see your value counts. You see a uh, Chongfu has sent the most messages. Uh, uh, if you know this guy, he sent a very funny message yesterday um, that was kind of top tier humor. But yeah. Yeah, then we can plot the graph. And of course, over here, you see from the beginning history of like NUS Hackers Chat all the way until now. Where is it? Oh, the graph. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, from, the, from the beginning of NUS Hackers Chat all the way until now, you have this this graph here of every single person who has sent a message and you count how many messages you send for every single person, right? So if you have sent a message in any other chat before, you can probably spot your name somewhere here. You can do that on your own as like an exercise. Yeah, but you might, some of you might complain, this looks a bit low resolution. How do you make it bigger, right? Uh, yeah, uh, again, Pandas is very powerful. You can kind of just like uh, adjust the figure size to make it like, higher resolution and like um, be words that you can actually read properly. Yeah. Okay. So um, 
just some like trivia here that we're not going to go in depth today. So what Pandas does is, is it actually uses this like third party library called Matplotlib. Okay, I'm just going to Matplotlib. Yeah, so Matplotlib is actually like a, um, a graph plotting library for, for Python. It's very powerful. Uh, if you guys are into data science, you definitely will have heard of Matplotlib. Uh, allows you to plot like a lot of very fancy data stuff and all. And um, there's this library also called Seaborn. Uh, Seaborn is oh, yet another data visualization library that actually is based on Matplotlib. So it kind of like makes it easy for you to plot data. It wraps around Matplotlib and makes it easy for you to, to like plot data. So if you have like profs who are like doing like, like I don't know, like climate research or even like life science or whatsoever, they'll be very familiar with this, right? Uh, there's an equivalent for this in like R as well, but well, okay, but that, we're not gonna cover that today. Now. That's uh, what the SDS guys will go through in that, okay? Cause uh, yeah. Right, so we, so okay, just quickly back to this. Uh, we changed our counting strategy, right? Um, this message has name, this message doesn't have name. And we kind of like, Instead of like selecting all the names, we now select all the messages. And if the message has name, we do not touch it. If the message does not have name, we kind of tag it with like the last seen name. Okay. So yeah, um, that's kind of the end of like the first part of that I wanted to show. And now we can move on to the second part. Um, yeah, so actually before I move on, I just wanted to say that um you realize there's actually a ton of cool stuff you can do with this, right? It's not just like generating a bar chart. Uh, uh, for those of you who are very interested in like doing very those um, like data visualizations, you can actually like generate a word cloud of the messages. So what are the words that most people type and, and all? Uh, generate a chart of like the group's average chat activity at different timings. So uh, you for like, for just for like, for funsies, you can like kind of like, um, plot like the graph chat activity uh, at certain timings and see maybe is it NUS hackers, people who are in the NUS hackers chat, maybe they're all awake at like 12 a.m. or like 1 a.m. Whereas uh, maybe a normal non-NUS hackers chat group, maybe a, I don't know, NUS buffet response team, for example. Okay, but that's, that's different. First, the buffet only happens in the day, but you get what I mean, right? You can kind of like do certain very cool stuff with it and compare like just patterns in general, okay? And, or you can even like do something interesting. You can fit all the messages that's like, that we discussed over here into like a machine learning model. And then maybe GPT-2 or something and just train like a machine learning model based on all the messages you see in like the chat group. And then you can like see what a machine learning model that talks like the NUS hacker sounds like or looks like. Very funky stuff. A lot of things you can do with this, right? So yeah, um, once again, back to the first point is that Automation is something that should be personal to you. You need to think about you know, you know what, what you want to do with it. There's a lot of things you can do with it, and Python helps you to do that. Right? Okay. Then next, I'm going to talk about the next uh, demo here, which is uh, downloading YouTube videos. Okay? So downloading YouTube videos, um, and uh, fortunately, it can be done with like Python as well, but uh, of course, NUS Hackers does not condone any like copyright misuse or infringement. So it is just a technical demo. All right, so I'm just saying that, okay. So yeah, I'm gonna send this uh, notebook link to the Zoom chat as well. Then you guys can just open it up. Uh, those on the, over here, you can just like type it as well. Yeah. Uh, feels good to be able to teach face-to-face uh, -face again. I used to, for two years, I've been teaching this over a webcam and people just share screen and all. So yeah, it's nice to be here. Right, okay, so I hope you guys can open the notebook and uh, maybe just save a copy of it so they can try it out on your own as well. Uh, this notebook actually, it's better if this notebook is run locally on your machine because like what I, what I mentioned previously, right? Uh, collab notebooks are actually running. Let me just uh, refresh this because I, I said I changed this to like light mode. Uh, yeah, collab notebooks are actually running, like your code is actually running on like Google servers. So if I were to download like YouTube videos, you'll be downloaded to like Google servers. Then if you want to like 
take it out again, you need to download from Collab again. So like this notebook is actually better run on like your own machine. But yeah, but it's okay. We're just like, I mean, I'm just saying like it's, it's still better for us to use this in the workshop, right? So um, problem statement here. So imagine like uh, you have someone in your family who that is not super good with technology, not like you guys can just like Google how to download YouTube videos. Then you all will know how to do it yourself, right? But like people who are not very good in technology in your family, they want, they have like a whole bunch of YouTube links and they ask you, oh, can you like download it? Uh, maybe turn it into MP3. So, you know, like those are music videos and stuff and then they just want to listen to the music. Well, of course you tell him no, that's illegal. But, you know, but as a curious hacker, you try to explore the possibility of doing so with your newfound Python skills, right? So, uh, git clone again. After cloning this, you'll see the exact same files that we do, we've used. And you'll see that over here, there's this youtube.txt. Uh, yeah, you see now for me to browse this file, I have to download it and see how it looks like. Yeah, so over here, we have a bunch of YouTube links here that, I, that I've just like um, put in for the purposes of this workshop. Some of you might recognize the second link. Uh, so, but yeah, uh, that's what we're gonna try. Okay, so oh wait, why did I download it? Where I, I actually had a code to just like print it out. <laughs> okay, yeah, so you, you see the links here, and these are the files I'm gonna try to download with Python, right? So, um, of course, we'll just like call this is just basic Python, right? We call like file.read lines. So, file.read lines actually just like reset into like a list of links. And a list of links, of course, uh, makes it easy for us to like um, um, iterate through it, right? And run repetitive tasks on it. So there's this um, very famous uh, tool called YouTube DL. And it also has like a Python library for it. So, okay, YouTube DL used to be very popular, but I'm not sure if it's like still used a lot now. Yeah, so because, uh, okay, just earlier this morning, I was trying to Google for like a, uh, download yeah python library to download youtube videos and it seems like uh, people are using a different python library now but i mean whatever works right is uh, once again it doesn't really matter what library i'm saying now or what library you guys are going to use it's just what use case you have about it and then you just find a library that does it for you okay but i'm using youtube.dl youtube dl uh and this is like a python library here and uh, for you to know how to use it, right? All you need to do is just like uh, open up their their documentation. So their documentation will just tell you like uh, how to install it, how to download it. Uh, this is the same steps as you would use whenever you like install any like third party library, right? So if you import, yeah. So uh, YouTube. So this is. Later on, the, all the code you see, right? I will say, of course, I didn't write it from scratch. I just really read like the documentation and then they will teach you how to use it. And then you just like copy paste it and then you just tune it until it works. That's really what most programming is. Okay. So, of course, right now when you try to import YouTube DL and YouTube DL, you, you'll say module not found because YouTube DL is not like a library that's by default installed in like Google Collab. So you need to like run pip install YouTube DL or, or you can use conda or whatever you prefer. Okay, so after we install YouTube DL into like the environment, then we are able to import it now. Then um, over here, like I said, what I did was I really just, where, where's the tab? Uh, I really just copied whatever's over here, right? So literally control C, control V, and then you just like run it and you, you can see like how the library works. So it's like downloading like a YouTube DL test video. And when this is done, uh, there's even like a progress bar over here. Uh, well, I'm on school Wi-Fi now, so it it's taking a while, but the moment it's done, right? You will see it appear here. Uh, yeah, this is the, the in progress file, I think. Yeah, it's dot .mp4 dot .pat. So it's still in progress. Yeah, so that's how you download like a YouTube uh, video just with Python. Okay, so uh, how do we download it as an MP3 file now? 
uh, if you look at the documentation, the documentation tells you, okay, how you can specify what you like to download like a file as. So uh, over here, for, from reading the documentation, it tells you that, okay, you can just download it as M MP3. And you can even set like the bit rate. So the higher this number is, the, the higher quality the audio file is. Uh, and you can actually download the same video as the one that we saw on top. Okay, so right now this is the, 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 the video actually completed already. So this is the, well, I can't tell. Okay, this is the video, but right now it's downloading like the, the MP3, I believe. Why is it M4A.py? Interesting. Well, okay, never mind. It's downloading now. Uh, yeah, so. Right, okay. So it downloaded it as M4A, and then afterwards, when it was done, right, it converted it to MP3. I, I'm not sure if the people on Zoom can see this. But yeah, right now it's an MP3 file. So now that we kind of know how to download a file as MP3, right? Very, very simple. Right? We, ju we just. Hang on. What did I do? Okay, uh, we'll just do the exact same thing, but on the list of videos that we just passed it in. And that's it. Our task is done, right? We really just use Python to help us to automate this a bit. Um, yeah, so the first thing is trying to download is the dark song. The second thing is a very nice song that I like a lot. Uh, it's Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. But yeah, okay. So. I'm not gonna like sit through and wait for it to like slowly download, but you guys can just test it out yourself, okay? Um, and yeah, that's it. We've actually finished all the demos for this uh, workshop, okay? So yeah, I'm just gonna like end all uh, and talk about where to go after this, right? So uh, if you want, if you want to get like get more ideas on like what you want to automate, okay? There's this free book online called AutomateTheBoringStuff.com. Uh, I will also like talk about some of the few things I've automated before. So um uh I sometimes automate sending out emails. So you know sometimes when you want to send out emails to like a lot of people and then you want to customize it with their names or customize it with like a custom um image or something. Okay, Python can do all that. Python actually has built in libraries to do like to, so to send emails or there are even wrapper libraries to make it easier for you to send emails. That kind of thing. So, or, 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 may, or, or of course, you could do it with like Outlook and Excel and then just do a mail merge as well. But, you know, I prefer to be more in control of like what I'm sending out. So, I'll typically use Python to automate like my email sending. So, um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are in the future, you, you might take like the software engineering mod in school and you realize that the prof there also does a lot of automation. All the emails that he sends you is actually addressed to your, your name. Uh, I think he also does all that with like Python as well. Yeah, so uh, you can check out other cool third party libraries. So like PyAuto GUI. PyAuto GUI, um, okay, funny story, right? So you know how in the, for the past two years, we were kind of like uh, be working from home and then when you're at home, you use certain tools for work, for example, Slack or like uh, primarily Slack. Uh. So when I was at work, I would use Slack, right? And then the thing is when you're on Slack, right? Um, if you are in, inactive for like 30 minutes, you won't show as online. But because everybody is working from home, then you want, kind of want to make it look like you're online doing work all the time, right? Okay, we, you might not be, but you might want to do that. So back when I was, should I say this or not? Okay, back when, for certain companies that I interned at, when I was like working, suppose, I mean, when I was supposedly working, uh, and I wasn't at my computer, right? I would use PyAuto GUI. So PyAuto GUI is a tool that you know can control your cursor, can control your keyboard, and then it will just move my cursor on its own, and so that my Slack constantly shows as myself being online. I mean, I mean, just to be just for a disclaimer, of course I was doing work, right? I'm just not on my computer, but I was doing work. Maybe I'm like, uh, whiteboarding and drawing out like uh, code structures and how to design code or for example. Right, so that PyAuto GUI can be used for that. Or you can use like request. So um, request is like a tool that allows you to like make API calls, okay? So we throw this down quite a bit, quite a, quite a bit, but APIs are essentially like um, software that, okay, like servers that you can get information out of, but 
you can kind of ask for information in certain ways. So uh, what request allows you to do is, for example, it can allows allow it can do a lot of things. Okay, it can fetch things like bus timings. It can um fetch data about oh, whether a certain car park has a uh, car park lots or not. So or even like um try to download things from like Canvas or Luminous, for example. So request is able to do that. So um yeah. So uh, there are workshops in the past where I, where I talk where I've taught how to use request before, but I'm not going to talk about it here. Now. Yeah, so otherwise, there's also other very other cool stuff you can do with Python, right? You can do like web development with like Django or Flask or make games in like PyGame or do data analysis with like NumPy, Pandas or Matplotlib or machine learning. So all this, uh, I think we'll cover them in the next few weeks. Uh, it will be done by the SDS guys, yeah. Uh, but if you wanted to automate stuff, like make certain things that like run on like a routine interval, Okay, there's this thing called cron jobs. So um, I'm thinking of okay. So cron jobs are um are things that run routinely. So um I I in certain group chats, right? Uh I, I will have like a bot that sends a message every day at like 12 a.m. Then I will just put that on, on like cron jobs on what on one of my Linux servers, and every time it hits 12 a.m., it will just like um trigger a script that sends like a message. So those are the, the type of automation that I do. Uh, or you can even make your own projects. Like So there's this like Hive Luminous, which is like uh, this tool that downloads all the information from Luminous, downloads all the files from Luminous that's written in Python. Uh, but although we don't really use Luminous these days, there's this new tool called Canvas Downloader. Uh, it's written in another, another programming language, uh, but yeah. So, yeah, th there's a lot of things you can do essentially, like just knowing the skills from Python and knowing how to effectively make use of like third party libraries. You end up not having to write a lot of your own code. And then you just like build on other people's work to like make your life easier. Okay. Yeah. Um yeah, so we have come to the end of our uh, of this uh, workshop. So we actually have like a post-workshop survey. Uh by the way, if anybody have questions, feel free to ask uh here or in the Zoom chat. Uh, but we'll appreciate it if you can like, you know, just like um, do this uh, survey so that you can give us some feedback on like how, whether you enjoyed the workshop and whether it was useful or not. Right. So if you would like to sign up for our next workshop on 4th September about creating Telegram bots, you can like also uh, uh, um, click on this link and just like fill up the form. Right, so if not, that's all for today. We are done for this uh, automation with Python workshop. Yep, thanks for being a great audience, you guys. <laughs>